Hello and welcome to The Arise interview where we take time to reflect on the big stories from the news and on the fortunes and affairs of the world in an hour of com commentators, analysts and thought leaders. I'm Charles Anyagolu. Coming up in the next 60 minutes, kidneys are one of the most important organs of the body. They clean your blood and they also regulate blood pressure. Well, today, with people dying in Nigeria and around the world every day whilst waiting for a kidney transplant, now made worse by the pandemic, and thousands of others sitting on the waiting list, we chart the story behind the work that's being done in Nigeria to try to offer everything from dialysis to renal replacement therapy for patients with kidney injury or failure. Coming up. Now, you may not know this, but the number of Nigerians with chronic kidney disease is on the rise and diabetes and high blood pressure linked to obesity appear to account for a significant percentage of that increase. The prevalence of chronic kidney disease among Nigerians has risen in the last decade with the illness accounting for more than 10% of all hospital admissions, according to the Journal of Tropical Medicine. Nigeria's aging population is part of the reason for the increased prevalence of kidney disease, along with substantially higher rates of obesity and diabetes, which are both risk factors for kidney disease. In addition, more Nigerians have high blood pressure, which often uncontrolled, and uh, high blood pressure can also damage the, uh, the kidneys. Well, in a moment, we'll speak to a doctor who specializes in the illness. But first, here's what your kidney actually looks like. Yeah, so this is a renal artery graft. So here you can see the renal artery, which you understand most to the recipient's external iliac or internal iliac artery. Here we see the renal vein, which we anastomose to the external iliac vein most of the time. And here we see the ureter, which we anastomose to the bladder or the ureter of the recipient. This is the kidney. Thank you. Well, that's a brief look there at the kidney. Well, for more on the growing challenge of kidney disease in Nigeria, I'm joined now in the studio by Dr. Martin Ibokwe, who is a consultant urologist and kidney transplant surgeon at the Zenith Medical and Kidney Center here in Abuja. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Um, let's start with the most important thing, which is what is the most common early sign of kidney disease? I mean, that's what will be on a lot of people's minds. How do I know that I am lurching towards kidney disease? Thank you. It's um, important to note that uh, kidney diseases could be asymptomatic. This means that a lot of people who work in the population have kidney diseases without knowing. This is buttressed by studies that have been done, uh, even in Nigeria all over the country where samples were taken from people in the community and it was discovered that a prevalence rate of up to 7% of them has some degree of kidney failure. So, but um, when patients become symptomatic, some of the things that they may complain about you know, will include things like reduction in the urine output, they pee a lot less than they used to, um, and because they are not urinating enough, they have swellings, you have facial puffiness. Usually it's more in the morning time and it regresses as the day goes by also swelling of the legs and the, the body as a whole. You see them. People may think they've added some weight, but this is because of excess fluid in their body. They could also have a frothiness of their urine. It may appear like it has some bubbles in it. Patients are generally sick. They feel nauseated. They vomit. They have a poor appetite. Um, these patients as well could sleep a lot longer than they should at night and in right. the day. Yes. So the ger generally these patients are unwell. Is, is, it, is it painful? Because, I mean, w when one thinks of not being able to, you know, pee as regularly as you ought to, I mean, you kind of think of, a, you know, the, the feeling you get when you wake up late at night and, and you've got to go to the sort of the bathroom. And uh, but it, it's not painful. In this circumstance, the individual is actually not making the urine, not that he right, has okay. urine. So it's can. actually just the excess thing being in their yes, system generally. not production. Right. I, I also didn't mention the fact that they could have hiccups, you know, they could have hiccups, and then there could also be uh, symptoms that are associated with the primary condition which could have led to the kidney disease. 
let's not forget patients who have kidney stones could actually have you know kidney failure and they will have complaint of pain in the flanks where the stones are located people who have obstructive uropathy where i'm saying this is in elderly men who have prostate related lesions like benign prostatic enlargement or prostate cancer these individuals cannot urinate because they have obstruction they may have the symptoms you spoke about difficulty with passing over the years mm. and the effect of this is back pressure on the kidneys and it could also shut down the kidneys among many others well that sounds like a scary movie but I mean, so many Nigerians are at risk. I mean, I, 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 one of our intros will say this, but I read somewhere that more than 10% of all hospital admissions today are kidney related. And this is absolutely true. Uh, studies have also shown that um, kidney diseases, kidney failure especially, mm. is more common in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, in Latin America, usually more common among people of lower social demographic you know, uh, index, you know, the poorer people as unexpected you know you think that the western world you know may have more of that but studies have shown actually that in sub-saharan africa we have a high prevalence of this disease unfortunately a large number of these uh, individuals or patients uh, don't have the wherewithal financially you know uh, the literacy levels to seek the appropriate care and to identify when they have this problem so this is a, a big concern for us here in nigeria right so um the big problem as you said because this I mean, we appreciate your being here. This is very educational, very informative. The big problem with kidney disease is that it often has no symptoms at all in its early stages and can go undetected on it until it, it is in its advanced stages. When it gets to that stage, it then becomes a matter of death unless the person gets dialysis. Is that right? This is absolutely true. Um, and of course, this buttresses the need for individuals to have their health check mm. yearly. You know, you have to have you know a good health-seeking behavior in order to be able to detect these things early. So it means that even when you don't have any sickness, every year you come and see your consultant, talk to him about how you feel, and run your basic tests to ensure that your renal function is perfect and all other parameters are perfect. This is the only way people can live a lot longer rather than coming to the hospital when they have advanced disease, which. Uh, is, is amenable to dialysis, as you mentioned, renal replacement therapy, and kidney transplant. The problem, of course, is that diagnosing it requires quite a lot of tests. And uh, as you correctly pointed out, a lot of people in Nigeria, not only do they not have the wherewithal to go to hospitals on that regular basis, but some of the hospitals that they go to are under-equipped and not able to actually make the proper diagnosis. Um, I will kind of disagree with that. The basic tests that are required to um, check one's renal function are available in almost all parts of the country. Mm. The problem will be that when the diagnosis is made, what uh, can be done about this? How can we intervene? And so it now becomes a problem because there are very few centers who have the facilities to actually treat these patients. Hemodialysis is not accessible in every part of this country and even when it is the patients cannot afford to have appropriate hemodialysis for a patient who has end-stage renal disease for instance he requires at least three sessions of hemodialysis per, per week and a session average in nigeria will cost about thirty thousand naira so this is about ninety thousand to hundred thousand naira per week not everybody can afford that yeah so when it's diagnosed the problem now becomes how do we treat these patients and we talk about kidney transplant being the gold standard treatment for uh, end-stage renal disease um, this is uh, only very few centers in Nigeria have the capacity to carry this out this is why uh, in the past medical tourism uh, was the way and mm. everybody had to raise money to travel to India or to the US or to the UK or Canada to have kidney transplant you know now there are centers in Nigeria who are equipped enough to do this but financing is still a problem because um, the health insurance scheme doesn't have a, a wide coverage you know, just about 10 to 15 percent of Nigerians have health insurance. And even when they do, this doesn't cover for advanced procedures like kidney transplantation. So we have quite some problems to deal with. And, and just to make the point, to buttress the point further that you're making um, and to emphasize to people the importance of these checks. I mean, a former president of Nigeria, Yara Dua, died of kidney disease complications, didn't he? That, that's absolutely true. Um, he had uh, uh, an autoimmune hypersensitivity kind of disease, Chuck Strauss syndrome, which uh, damaged, damages a lot of organs, including the kidneys. Uh, I'm aware that uh, he required 
uh, you know, hemodialysis and kidney transplantation, if at least on one occasion, which was done overseas. So this is a disease that hits home because uh, it's prevalent in our environment. Mm. All you have to do is look and you'll find. And is there a cause for kidney disease? I mean, if so, what is the leading cause? Oh, just like you had said earlier, you know, hypertension and diabetes mellitus account for about 85% of kidney failure mm. worldwide. In Nigeria, uh, it's slightly different because uh, chronic glomerulonephritis, an infective condition of the kidney, comes uh, up as well, unlike in the West. You know, this is um, uh, as, as well as other diseases, mm. as we mentioned, obstructive uropathy, like you see in uh, prostate enlargement, urethral strictures, you know, patients who have uh, cystic conditions of the kidney, like polycystic kidney disease, mm. they also come into this category. Uh, and then uh, you mentioned obesity being very largely linked, you know, with kidney diseases, cigarette mm. smoking, you know, uh, excessive alcohol ingestion. There are also uh, ch childhood diseases that predispose to, to kidney failure, mm. you know, uh, like what you, when you have what we call the posterior uh, uh, urethral valve, this is the commonest cause of kidney failure in, in young boys. So it runs through all age groups. We see a lot of children these days, they come for kidney transplants. Mm. So, yes, uh, I've heard quite a lot of children. Yes, yes, um, yes. And, and when there is complete failure uh, of, of those kidneys, I mean, you need a kidney transplant, don't you? Or, or dialysis, which is basically a machine that does the job of the kidney. Yes, sir. Um, when you have end-stage renal disease, this is when mm. your kidneys are able to actually uh, carry out their functions. There is a definition of that we have, uh, where we define that. You require what we call renal replacement therapy. So renal replacement therapy can be dialysis, which can be hemodialysis, where you plug to a machine, which sucks your blood in and detoxifies it of all the toxic waste and then returns it to your body. Or it can also be what we call peritoneal dialysis, where uh, a tube is inserted you know, into your abdomen and it's uh, with a diacylate fluid which goes in and wash, kind of eradicates some of the toxic waste. This is dialysis. But the gold standard worldwide and the treatment of choice which gives you a longer life, gives you a quality life as close to how it used to be before you got sick is kidney transplantation. So this remains uh, the gold standard in replacement therapy worldwide. Well, we're going to take a break soon. And when we come back, I want to talk about how that process that you're talking about, the gold standard of kidney transplantation, has affected people uh, in this country with all the other pandemic and, and stuff going around the place. But I mean, I'm curious about you personally. How did you get into this branch of medicine? Oh, um, I uh, always wanted to be a surgeon. Uh, my dad was a medical doctor, so I had the interest in medicine a long time, for a very long time. So uh, while you know, doing sc medical school, I uh, looked at all the specialties of surgery. Uh, I considered plastic surgery, um, but you know, it, 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 it didn't offer me as much as what I would have wanted. And then urology. Urology was excellent. It's um, an aspect of surgery which deals with the uh, gentourinary system of males and the urinary system of females. Um, this is an excellent specialty because um, it, gives you, it gives me the room to impact lives, you know, like um, uh, as, as we do now, giving people new kidneys, you know, giving them uh, a brand, you know, just imagine mm. someone who's not making urine and re requires dialysis every three times a week. And after his transplant, he doesn't require any dialysis. He just walks around, adds a lot of weight, right. and is back to life. So this is um, something that it's makes a very it helpful fantastic. Thing. Yes. Right, OK, so. stay with us. We want to talk to you some more. You're watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our in-depth look at the growing problem of kidney disease in Nigeria in the era of the pandemic. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyagulu. Now, as you may have heard on the program, the increase in the prevalence of kidney disease in Nigeria appears to be due to more cases of high blood pressure and diabetes being diagnosed, and much of that is also caused by obesity. This increase in obesity seems to explain the increase in extra protein in the urine. Uh, chronic kidney disease increases the risk of heart disease as well as kidney failure and other complications. Currently, there are thousands of people with kidney failure who are treated 
uh, by dialysis or transplantation, and that number is expected to increase to, uh, dramatically in the next decade. Experts say that if diabetes continues to increase and obesity continues to increase, then it stands to reason that the prevalence of kidney disease will continue to increase. In Nigeria, the magnitude of the problem is alarming, adding to the burden of other diseases in Nigeria, including, of course, the coronavirus. In a moment, we'll continue our chat with the consultant urologist and kidney transplant surgeon, Dr. Martin Ibukwe. But first, here he is, along with other doctors, carrying out a kidney transplant here in Abuja. <laughs> And of course, on, on the left of the screen, there is uh, Dr. Martin Ibokwe, who is a consultant urologist and kidney transplant surgeon at the Zenith Medical and Kidney Center here in Abuja. And he is still with me in the studio. Thank you for staying with us. What does it feel like to see yourself carving people up there? It's what I do. I, I love to do this, so it's, it's exciting. Right, but it, it must be interesting looking at a human being. I mean, did you sort of look at people and you can see them in three dimensions, as it were? You can go beyond the, the face and the sort of the body and the skin and you sort of see tissue and bones and organs and all that sort of thing. Uh, no, I don't. I don't see. I see them as the, the human beings that they are. So, but w when they're on the table, um, I don't see them that way because we, we drape them. So you only uh, see the, the part section. of the body. Yes, right, where, okay. Where well, I mean, we were talking about this earlier. Obviously, you source for kidneys all over the world when you're, doing tr when you're trying to transplant a kidney. Um, usually, it's a very synchronized and well-choreographed process of uh, delivery when a donor kidney is found um, wherever it is in the world. I mean, how does that seamless or how has that seamless process been affected by the coronavirus pandemic? All right, so, um, so I'll have to um, correct that a bit. So in, in the Western world, like mm. in the UK and the US, uh, and even in South Africa, they have uh, policies that allow for cadaveric donors, cadaveric kidney donors. This means it's also called deceased donors. Like a cadaver, basically. Yes, this, this actually means that when an individual dies, when someone is confirmed to be brain dead, you know, or the heart is dead, from whatever condition, an accident or some chronic illness, and his kidneys are fine, um, once this individual has given a consent for his organs, organs to be taken, it can actually be harvested mm. and taken anywhere within the country where you have uh, uh, a recipient who, who requires that organ. All right? but, but this is not the, the picture here in Nigeria. In Nigeria, we don't have such a policy. I'm aware that at this point, you know, there is somewhere in the Senate still being worked on, but you know, we have a lot of challenges with following that up. Mm. So in our environment, what we, op what we do here is what we call the living donor system. This means that all the kidneys come from living people. So this uh, reduces the chance. It, we don't have to you know, fly all over the country looking for a kidney. No. So what we do is that the patients, the recipients, the patients who have kidney failure uh, come to the hospitals with their sons, with their daughters, their brothers, sisters. Some younger ones come with their parents once, once they are not uh, above a certain age. And uh, we have various kind of tests carried out on these uh, blood-related you know, individuals to identify who is cl the closest match. We carry out what we call the HLA match, the DSAs, to find out who has the closest cell lines to the mm. individual. The closer the cell lines to the individual, the lesser the chances of the body rejecting this new kidney. So in our environment here is only living donors you know, that, we, that we use. Right. And um, is it a big challenge finding those donors? It's a massive challenge. In fact, the, as I mentioned, in the West where they have cadaveric donors, this is because of the limitation in getting living donors. 
You know, I'm sure if uh, someone grabbed you and said, Mr. Charles, can you give me your kidney? You, you have to think about it. You probably have to go home and have a meeting with your family and go to the church. So it's very challenging to get a living donor. So this is, um, so this is why there's always going to be a limitation to the number of li people willing to donate their kidneys, especially right. in an environment like this where, you know, uh, there are a lot of fetish and spiritual There's things. There's superstition, Superstitious. People right. uh, just don't get it. How, how do I donate an organ to you? Am I going to survive after that? Mm. Is my destiny going to be tied to you and things like that? Right. So this is why they require some form of education. But, but you, can, you education. can continue to thrive with one kidney, can you? Oh. Definitely, a, a kid. A it, it wouldn't put too much pressure on that kidney. No, so a, a kidney, a, a single kidney, has about four times the capacity to sustain a human being. So with two kidneys, you have about eight times the capacity. So, so why two kidneys? <laughs> this is I the mean, way God God made us. Right, know? because I'm wondering. Because that's the question. I mean, you yes, talked sir. about superstition. Beyond superstition, just on a practical level, a lot of people would say, "Well, I was made with two kidneys." It's a bit like saying I, I've got two legs. You know, you want to take one off. Obviously, things you know, it, it, the balance is going to be skewed. Yes, yes, yes. But um, but science has shown us from studies on on living donors that they they can live a normal life. Right. They can you know, live up to you know the normal age. For, there, there was no difference between the normal person in the population and an individual who had donated his kidney. Mm. So this is why we are emboldened. This is why science has made it you know proper to actually you know donate an organ to to. To a person that requires it. Right. So how has this, I mean, you, you talked about living people being donors. How has it been affected? Because we know there's quite a lot of people in Nigeria waiting for transplants or, you know, something to that effect. I mean, um, does it mean that people during this pandemic who are waiting for a kidney will simply not get the call? I mean, there, there hasn't been a call coming through to say, oh, there's a kidney because people are not going to the hospitals to do that. All right, so for the first uh, four weeks of the pandemic, mm. actually nobody was getting the call because, you know, it took the world by storm, as you know. So um, it affected the way, you know, our modus operandi because mm. normally patients will come into the hospital, you know, get tested, identify who has, you know, end-stage renal disease. Mm. They have dialysis and they start to prepare, you know, for kidney transplantation, you know, bringing their loved ones to run tests. But when this came on board, the first thing was there was a lockdown. So people couldn't actually move freely. They couldn't mm. even find their way to the hospital in the first place. And if you had a son in another state, he couldn't even come to have the test done. So transportation and getting around was a big issue for a good couple of months. And did that affect mortality rates? And Most certainly, sir. I, I forgot to mention that patients with kidney disease, especially end stage renal disease, are at a higher chance of even contracting COVID-19. Yes, of and course. And dying yes. from COVID-19. Yeah. As well as patients... Who are having trans who have had transplant you know because they have to be on immunosuppression mm. which suppresses their immunity so these are high risk group of patients with COVID. so covid 19 is not a friendly disease to the kidney patient and and briefly before we go on break um kidney disease can afflict anyone can't it i mean it doesn't have a specific age range but it hits people young and old it hits young and old but we know from the nigerian statistics that the peak age that we see is somewhere between 40 and 50 years old in Nigeria, that is that is that is the mean age of the patients that come down, um, and I will say that the age group in Nigeria and Sub-Saharan Africa is less than what we see in the West. In the West, the patients come in their sixties, usually from diabetes or hypertension. Mm. But in our environment, uh, this is why chronic glomerulonephritis, which is a form of inflammatory condition of the kidney, also has a huge stake in the etiology of chronic kidney disease in our environment. Right. Yes, sir. Okay, stay with us. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, you're watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat about the growing problem of kidney disease in Nigeria in the era of the pandemic and beyond. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Anyegogo. 
Now, as we continue to explore some of the issues surrounding health, well-being and fitness in the era of the pandemic, today we are looking at the growing problem of kidney disease in Nigeria. And a doctor who specializes in the illness, Dr. Martin Ibokwe, is my guest today. Data from the Journal of Tropical Medicine shows that the prevalence of kidney disease is increasing and that it appears to reflect at least in part the increasing incidence of diabetes, high blood pressure and obesity. The findings also underscore the importance of early recognition of kidney disease and the need for preventive strategies. Since current treatments only slow down kidney progression, more research funds need to be allocated to understanding the reasons why kidney disease is progressing and how we may be able to prevent it. Well, one hospital here in Abuja, known as the Zenith Medical and Kidney Center, is at the forefront of research and treatment into kidney disease in Nigeria. Dr. Martin Ibokwe is a consultant urologist and kidney transplant surgeon at that center here in Abuja, and he is still with me in the studio. Thank you for staying with us. Thank you, sir. It's my pleasure. So how are you raising awareness of kidney disease in Nigeria? I mean, obviously you're on television talking about it, but I mean, how else? Oh, yeah. So um, apart from television, well, we're also on the radio from time to time. We've been on many of the radio stations in Abuja here trying to inform people of uh, what kidney diseases mean, how do you identify when you have a kidney disease, especially at the early stage, and trying to encourage them to come in for routine checks, make mm. the lifestyle you know, modification to come in for your health check every year, irrespective of you know, whether you feel sick or not. We also uh, have platforms. We are on all the social media platforms on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and try just putting the word out there. Um, the associations, we have uh, medical associations in Nigeria and all the specialties like the Nephrology Association and the, uh, the Urological Association, which I belong to, also, you know, go, go a long way, you know, in trying to educate the public, you know, in, you know, the most important place to educate them is in the communities, mm. you know, they need to know in the communities that these and these are the things they must identify to know, you know, for, for instance, the hypertensive who is not taking his medications. It's like a time bomb waiting, you know, ticking. And by the time he's coming to the hospital, he already has end organ damages in the heart, you know, the eyes, and the kidneys. So these are the group of people that we need to get to in the communities and bring them into the hospitals early enough so in order to give them, because when you see them early, you're likely to have offered them a longer survival because their, their chronic disease like hypertension or diabetes is controlled. And this slows down progression to end stage renal disease and requirement for renal replacement therapy. Is there a cure for kidney disease? Um, for chronic kidney disease, um, let me start from there. There is no cure. Chronic kidney disease is defined as an irreversible attrition of the nephrons. Right. All right? So this means that the damage to the kidney is irreversible. But what you can do is to slow down the progression to end stage renal disease. End stage is at the point where the kidney, you know, makes, makes very little urine, less than 15 mils, you know, uh, per mil per right. 1.7 meters squared. So you want to slow down this progression because once you get to that stage, this patient is dialysis dependent or will require kidney transplant. Kidney transplant is the closest thing that comes to cure because you give this person a new kidney that makes urine, he doesn't require dialysis, but even that is not uh, a cure because he will have to be on drugs forever. The immunosuppressants have to be taken forever in order to uh, prevent his body from identifying the new kidney right. as a foreign body. A bit like and high blood pressure. I mean, you, you kind of drink the medicine permanently, exactly. don't you? Exactly. Right. And, and what sort of numbers, I don't know if this is a fair question, but what sort of numbers of patients do you have in Nigeria on dialysis? Are those figures available? Well, th th there's a problem with figures in Nigeria because, um, you know, you need to have a central system right. which records all the, uh, you know, the centers, all the centers across Nigeria mm. who are having dialysis. So this has been very difficult to, to, you know, to corroborate in Nigeria, to give us statistics. Worldwide, we have figures worldwide, which, you know, so it, you find it difficult to, you know, understand why in Nigeria we can't tell ourselves, you know, the numbers that have dialysis every day, every month, 
in every part of the country. So it's, it's been a challenge. And yeah, then, but why is that? Because, I mean, you're, you're part of a society. I mean, there are medical societies, medical journals and things that that's what they do. I mean, it, it isn't always the government's, although the government really ought to have statistics. I mean, the Ministry of Health and so on. Um, because, you know, if people are coming in from abroad or wherever and want to do medical, you know, set up hospitals or whatever, they want to see those statistics. Um, but, I mean, aren't the organizations and the, you know, the groups that your members of, don't they sort of think, okay, we deal with kidney stuff, perhaps we ought to get all the hospitals that we know and, um, and get a, a, a number sort of a yeah, Yes, they do. There are, there, are, there are figures. But what I was trying to say is the reliability of this. Right, okay. Yes. So on, at the moment, it's estimated that up to 50 to 100,000 Nigerians are having dialysis, chronic dialysis. This is uh, with exception of acute renal failure, whereby an individual uh, who's apparently healthy mm. um, loses a lot of fluids, either from bleeding or from excessive vomiting or excessive diarrhea, and his kidneys shut down in an attempt to save him from losing too much fluids. This individual may require some hemodialysis just for a brief period to allow the kidneys to recover before, you know, uh, and they can recover completely actually, mm -hmm. and he doesn't require dialysis anymore. But we're talking about patients who are maintenance dialysis, who have to go to the hospital every week to have some form of dialysis. And um, are there many people um, waiting for kidney transplants in Nigeria? I suppose it's the same thing in terms of the statistics. I mean, do you have any figures on that in terms of numbers? Yes, sir. There are a good number of Nigerians right. waiting for kidney transplantation. Um, these numbers are, are likely to have increased in the coronavirus era because, as I mentioned, in the past, the norm was for any patient who required kidney transplant mm. to go overseas. So you see them, you know, trying to source for funds and trying to make arrangements for so, with, in, in some other countries. Of course, the coronavirus pandemic, you know, nullified any of that because nobody can actually leave the country at this mm. time, whether you're rich or you're poor. So, um, so but this offered also an opportunity for you know, local content for people who have been doing this to actually expand their scope and start to do a lot more to raise. And this, this is one of the positives that I've seen from the coronavirus pandemic because, you know, when you have this large waiting number who require this service, mm. then it's only, you know, it's imperative that somebody at home here has to decide that, well, we can, we've been doing this, we can do this on a larger scale. And so this is, this is something that has to be encouraged, especially in the, in this, in the health sector. Right. Uh, let me ask you this, because I think you answered it peripherally um, earlier, but it kind of flows from the, the questions I'm asking you now. Are there many people who die before they receive those transplants in Nigeria? Yes, sir. Um, from, uh, from studies, uh, like a study from Aragundadi et al. in Ife, hmm. over 50% of patients in antigenal disease die within the first six months. This is because... Um, they either not having enough dialysis or they can't even afford to have dialysis in the first place. Mm. Talk more of having kidney transplantation. All right. In the past, it was said that just about 10% of patients who were on the waiting list for kidney transplantation eventually had kidney transplantation done in Nigeria. The rest, either, you know, uh, a lot of them couldn't afford to have this and they died. And then another 20% afforded to go overseas to have their kidney transplantation. Mm. So you see now that we have a good 70 to 80 percent of patients with antigenal disease who are waiting there to have kidney transplants. They are either raising funds or looking for their donor from you know one of their relatives as the case may be. So you know the COVID-19 pandemic has changed the landscape if I may say to some extent in regards to kidney transplantation. Right, right. I mean let's talk about the quality of life of people for example who are alive and have the, the disease. Obviously, you know, they'd have to be alive for us to talk about the quality of life. But how much is life a struggle for people, for instance, who are on dialysis? I mean, because I understand that even on their days off from dialysis, they can also struggle with the effects of, of being tired and sort of dehydrated and all that sort of thing. You, you, you have that right, sir. Um, the, the quality of life is not, is not very good for patients who are on chronic hemodialysis. Mm. We'll start from the fact that um, because th they have to continue having this, it means that sometimes they could still have the symptoms of uh, chronic kidney disease. I mean, the vomiting, the nausea, you know, they lose weight. A lot of them are bloated because they have a lot of fluids. Um, let's also go to the fact that, you know, they require uh, some form of central cannulation. This means they need a big 
uh, cannula, a big line or access into their blood vessel through which the blood is uh, sucked into the machine. So this artery requires a, sen a line from the neck, the jugular line, or the femoral. So imagine having to have that repeatedly. So a lot of times by the time you see them, some of those vessels are really damaged from repeated you know, cannulations. Some of them, after a couple of months, it's difficult to even get an access for them. So some people actually die from lack of having an access to have hemodialysis. You know, and I, as I mentioned, you know, because the chronic kidney disease affects um, the blood level, the kidneys produce uh, you know, a, 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 a substance called erythropoietin, which stimulates the bone marrow to produce blood. So patients who have kid chronic kidney disease, are, they always appear like they're anemic, low blood levels, yes, very weak. Of course. You know, in the past, they used to have a lot of blood transfusions that were needless, but these days, there are drugs, erythropoietin supplements that can be given to boost them and reduce the need for blood transfusion because blood transfusion has its own risks in these patients. Especially the fact that it can also affect your eligibility for kidney transplant because a lot of antibodies or antigens can be, you know, can be transfused into these patients. So they, they require repeated transfusions, repeated hospital admissions. So this is why when the chance is available, you know, kidney transplantation is the best because this offers them the best quality of life as close to possible mm. as their pre-morbid you know, quality of life. Yes. I have to say that listening to you, I feel weak. The, the reason is because, I mean, what you're describing just sounds so, I mean, horrendous, really, what people have to go through. And of course, children go through this sometimes. It's not just ad adults and stuff like that. I mean, how do you cope as a doctor with situations like that? Uh, because, I mean, here you and I are talking about it, and I'm already feeling queasy without actually being anywhere near a patient. Imagine being the person who has to insert those sort of tubes and pipes into a person and watch them, you know, the, the physical impact of what you're doing every single time that they come in. How does that affect you? Well, you know, it's, um, it's the job and um, you have to have a passion for what you do. You also have to have empathy. You, you have to feel like those patients are your relatives or your siblings. So you try and make, you know, whatever service you offer them to be as uh, painless, as seamless as possible, mm. okay, and give them the best. You know, the truth is when, when you give your patients the best, it's, it, you get some reward for, for what you do. So as you mentioned, children come in, yes. We've had to do services for children, kidney transplants, and all that in adults. So, but, you know, for every patient, you give him the best. You know, you, because, you know, you, you, you don't play God. You can't determine who survives mm. or who lives. But when you give them all the best, you are going to be amazed at um, the, the, the successes. And this is part of you know, our testimonies and our mm. motivation to do more because you see people doing so well when you offer them the best services. And, and just briefly, we've got to take a break in, in 20 seconds. I mean, it, does, it, does it make you see the human being more as just a, a machine, really, with, you know, like a car? You've got to make sure the plugs and so on and so forth are working. Uh, not, no, 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 not at all. Because I'm a human being as well, and I wouldn't love to be seen as a car or an aeroplane. So, I see them as human beings that, 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 that should live and should live healthy. Right, okay, stay with us. You're watching the Arise interview, plenty more still ahead as we continue our in-depth look at the growing problem of kidney disease in Nigeria. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyagolu. Now, the burden of kidney disease in both children and adults in Nigeria is largely unknown, but it is estimated that acute kidney injury and chronic uh, kidney disease affects millions of people in this country. However, according to the experts, these estimates probably significantly undervalue the burden of kidney disease in the country because they derive from urban centers. The lack of data on the true burden of kidney disease impairs the need for prioritization and constitutes an obstacle to efficiently allocating scarce resources. Nigeria's image of chronic kidney disease is frequently associated with pediatric patients checking into health facilities late, often with barely any kidney function left, no health care financing options, and consequently they die before or soon after dialysis. Studies have revealed that a majority of people with kidney and urinary tract anomalies in Nigeria 
are only sent to hospital when they require renal replacement therapy. That's in sharp contrast to patients in the developed world who are often identified before or even soon after birth. Well, Dr. Martin Ibuque, consultant, urologist and kidney transplant surgeon at the Zenith Medical and Kidney Center here in Abuja is still with me in the studio. Thank you very much for your patience and for your meticulous information. Very important. Let's talk about the services you offer at the Zenith Medical and Kidney Center here in Abuja. You have read that you're one of Nigeria's leading le renal care centers. I mean, how state of the art is it? Yeah, so um, in, in, in our center, you know, um, our center is uh, a quaternary center, as I'll call it, you know, um, equipped with all the necessary gadgetry to uh, treat kidney patients. But we don't restrict ourselves only to kidney patients. Mm. We treat all spectrum of medical and surgical patients in our hospital. But for, the, for, for this discussion, we'll be talking more about the renal services. So. Um, in our center is, is a hundred bedded you know center so we can cater and admit you know up to 100 patients we have uh, about 40 uh, hemodialysis machines so uh, this is one of the most centers with the most uh, uh, dialysis machines in the country so we have designated machines for the children for patients who have any sort of viruses which we don't want to you know uh, you don't want to use the same machine for patients who are seronegative for those viruses so we, we have it all um, we have uh, a six bedded uh, uh, intensive care unit and a six bedded uh, high dependency unit these are for patients who are critically ill who would require some form of invasive monitoring and very critical monitoring especially uh, for our patients who just uh, had kidney transplant. We also have uh, a twin theater complex and, uh, and a third one in, 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 the, in the rooftop where we perform many types of surgeries for kidney patients, including uh, surgeries for kidney stones, uh, stones in the kidneys, in the ureters, on the bladder. Um, we perform you know, surgeries for kidney tumors. We also perform kidney transplant, which is what we are renowned for in the country. We right. perform the most kidney transplants in the country. Um, so we perform an average of 10 to 15 kidney transplants per month, and we have you know, sustained this for the last uh, three to four years. Yes. Right. Okay. And, and just, uh, I know you've gone through this previously, but just so for people who may be joining us a bit late, what tests are available? I mean, what tests do you have to do to see if, if you've actually got sort of kidney disease or, or kidney failure or something? All right, so uh, before the test, you're going to see a doctor, a specialist, mm -hmm. who can identify the symptoms that you have first, right? So see a doctor, he talks to you and examines the patient. A lot of times, a specialist already knows that you have some form of kidney failure just by doing that. The tests are just to confirm. All right, so these tests will include your full blood count. As I mentioned, your blood the blood level of patients with chronic kidney disease is usually low. All right. Uh, also, the renal function test. This is very important. The kidney function test. We call mm -hmm. that the serum electrolyte urea and creatinine. Some of the toxins that should be eliminated by the body will not be will not be because of poor you know kidney function. So usually we have a very high urea and creatinine level in these patients. Uh, they could also have high potassium levels, which can actually stop the heart and they, they mm -hmm. die on the roadside. Um, we also do a urinalysis for them. We take urine and there are things we see on the urinalysis that will suggest to us that there's chronic kidney disease. Um, also, an ultrasound scan tells us uh, how the kidneys look for those who may have. Uh, diseases like polycystic kidney diseases. These are, this is a kidney that is just full of water or a ballooned, you know, a, an obstructed system where there's a lot of urine in the kidney. So the ultrasound can also give us some information as regards what the kidneys look like. For those that, that may require higher forms of investigations, yes, we have a computerized tomography scan. We call this a CT scan, which is a, a superior form of imaging or x-ray, which will examine the urinary tract completely. When we use it with the contrast, the contrast is eliminated by the kidneys. So by the time you see the kidneys are not eliminating the contrast, it suggests mm. to you that these kidneys uh, are no, no longer working as they right. should. So these are some of the few tests that, uh, that, that can be carried out on patients who have you know, kidney right. failure. Uh, and if someone, for instance, gets their results back and um, there is evidence of kidney disease, they would then be referred to a renal consultant such as yourself are there many renal consultants, urologists, kidney specialists in Nigeria? Yeah, so the, the uh, first point of call is the nephrologist. The nephrologist is the physician, mm -hmm. uh, the physician, I mean, not a surgeon, who caters for uh, these patients. So uh, as I'll say, there are nephrologists 
all over the country, in every state of the country, there are good representatives. The only problem is that, just like in Nigeria, there are, you know, there's a maldistribution. You see most of the specialists located in Abuja and Lagos and mm. more of the urban centers, and very few in the rural areas, where we have more of the population of right, people. absolutely. Yes, sir. So the nephrologists are the first point of call. They are the ones that diagnose this condition and institute renal replacement therapy like hemodialysis to sustain these patients. All right. The urologist has uh, his own role, and the role of the urologist comes when there is a need for surgery. For instance, when patients have stones mm. obstructing the urinary system, when they have an enlarged prostate that requires some form of surgery to you know, unobstruct the urinary system, and then when they require kidney transplant. So the nephrologist has the primary role in management of patients with kidney failure, and the urologist has you know, a lesser role, but you know, on some of the patients who right. require form of surgical intervention. And I mean, in, in today's world, we hear a lot of um, recommendations of sort of lifestyle dietary changes. You know, for example, if you're somebody who, who is diabetic or pre-diabetic or something, you can change the type of food you eat, you know, um, and that can actually affect the, the, your rating and reduce it considerably, the threat that you face. Do you have that sort of thing with kidney disease? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Um, don't forget, as we said before, hypertension and diabetes account for about 85% of patients with kidney mm. failure. So the reduced salt in diet also stands, right? You know, the patients, when they are in end-stage renal disease, will actually restrict the amount of fluid that they take like what you may think that you want them to take because a lot of time when the kidney is not functioning if you take more water it stays back in the system and you mm. can't pee so you require more uh, you have more dialysis even though that person is often dehydrated exactly so you can right. see the vicious cycle all right proteins we limit the amount of proteins in, you know in the in the diet because as you mentioned a lot of protein is wasted in the in, in the kidney in, mm. from the kidneys all right then as i diabetes mellitus is also a very uh, important etiology so you want to keep a very tight glycemic control. You want the blood sugar to be well controlled, either it's by the oral hypoglycemic agents, I mean the drugs, or by insulin, as the case may be, right? Yes, so you want to keep the sugar, because the, the better the, the glycemic control, the lesser the patient, the patient's kidney deteriorates mm. into end-stage renal disease. Yes, sir. You're also advised to take uh, fruits and vegetables, as you know, this. These vitamins are very necessary for Absolutely. healing and, uh, you know, they contain antioxidants that help to, you know, destroy some of the bad, you know, metabolites in the, in the, in the system. So these are some of the lifestyle modifications, along with exercise. Right, exercise of course. Is, very know, important. Very important. Brisk walking, at least. Even if you're not strong enough to jump, brisk mm. walking on your treadmill, this helps the system. It helps your heart. It helps you, your insulin, it helps you to improve on insulin resistance, among other things. Your blood pressure control is better when you, when you, uh, when you work out. And then things like cigarette smoking, alcohol ingestion, you know, uh, herbal concoction ingestions, these are things that are toxic mm. and can cause more harm. So you want all our patients to stop, you know, some of those. And this goes a very long way in um, improving their quality of life and, uh, yes. Well, Dr. Martin Ibokwe, I want to thank you very much indeed. You're an absolute star, and we appreciate your patience and your, the information that you've given us today. Very, very important. Dr. Martin Ibokwe is a consultant urologist and kidney transplant surgeon at the Zenith Medical and Kidney Center here in Abuja. Thank you. My pleasure. Sir. Well, that's it for this edition of The Arise Interview. Do join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja. Bye-bye, and thank you for watching.